Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about smart vectors and um, a couple tools that we can use in Nuke to make good usage of them. So in order to start, I need a, a moving footage. So I grabbed this one online, I'll put the link of the website that provides pretty good quality footage for free, so we can use that for training. So in order to start, I just want to make sure that we understand what the vectors are. So the vectors in general, and in Nuke in particular, are describing a direction between one frame and another. So so for example, if we zoom in on this guy here and we are at frame uh, 20, it's here. Right? I'm going to put a marker here and then at frame 21, it's there, right? So it has moved maybe four or five pixels uh, south and the vector of this movement goes from this point to that point. So in this case, the vector would be minus about four pixels negative Y, right? Going down. And for this guy, it would be about the same, right? But if you go further in the thing, then you can see that, let's say this guy, this house here, the corner of this house, from one frame to another, it moves maybe three pixels this way, and then three pixels that way. So the vector will be plus three in X and minus three in Y. Once we get that, what Nuke can do for us with the smart vectors, it can analyze plates and try to find all the vectors in the scene, try to find like where every pixel is going. Before we jump into the smart vector, I just want to look at another vector generator a node. It's not the smart vectors, but it gives us a one pass of vectors that it puts in the motion. So that's what it looks like. So every frame is trying to detect how the pixel at this position is going to move uh, to the next position. These values here I used uh, by Nuke to describe to itself the values of the vectors. So you don't really need to understand exactly how this works, but what you need to know is that every frame, Nuke is recalculating vectors and then being like, how does this move, how does that move, right? In this case, it just goes into one channel that is called the motion channel, right? So now back to the smart vectors. So I'm going to create a node, smart vectors. So the smart vector nodes generates vectors that we can use later on in other node like specifically the vector distort node and the vector distort node is going to be used to paint something on one frame and then with the help of the smart vectors carry that paint that we did on only one frame through different frames and I'll, I'll show you an example and then it'll probably make sense to you the smart vectors are a little smarter than the vector generator that we looked at just before and it doesn't give you a visual output but it doesn't really matter because you usually we use it just to export vectors so you can either export vectors directly from here and it's going to export a uh, exr sequence that you can use as an input for another node like a vector distort node okay so let's look at the parameters here so frame distance is basically the precision at which you're going to calculate the vectors. Once you set that and you export it, you write it, this is set for good. So you need to get an idea of, of what you want here. If you have the feeling that in your video, there is a lot of like micro movement, like things are moving very differently every frame, then you want to have something like one or two. And if something is moving really smoothly, like it seems to be here, you want to have something high. It, you know, it goes between one and six, and then one is uh, kind of a short distance move, and then six is like kind of wide. So for this one, in theory, I would take six, you know, I'll, but I'll take a four in order to show you with the vector distort node what difference it makes. If it's something smooth, then you want a higher value. If it's something erratic, uh, then you want something lower, like a one or two. Okay, next is the vector detail. The vector detail is a way to catch smaller moves next to other moves. So basically, if you put it higher, you will catch finer movements, you know, something that is a smaller movement by putting it higher, so the detail will be higher. And if you put it lower, you're just looking for more global moves. So at first, I usually leave it at what it is, 0.3, uh, because it's a good average that works with a, a lot of different footage. The strength of the vector is how strongly it tries to match the pixel between frames. So it's going to look at one frame against the next frame. It's how strongly it's going to try to match the move. The match channel is if you have something in a scene that you don't want to create vectors for. For example, if we had like, let's say, a plane here that would pass over the plate or a bird that is passing very close to the camera or following the camera for a while, 
well, this bird is going to have vectors itself that are different from the vectors of the plate, right? If a bird is doing is moving left to right here, and our plate is moving uh, top to bottom, then it will bother uh, the overall direction of the vectors, and you might not want that. So a very common thing is like, let's say you are generating vectors for a driving shot, and then you have people walking. So you might want to roto these people out and then put them in the match channel, and it will disregard these people, right? So let's turn that on just to uh, show you the other options. Uh, the in-paint matte region is something that once you have, let's say, I'm going to draw something real quick. And in here, I'm going to say, okay, take the source alpha and match that. So don't use what's in the alpha. The problem with that is that, of course, you're going to be left with a hole in your uh, vectors here, right? Whatever is in there. It's going to be a hole and you don't have you're not going to have the vectors while the in paint matte region what it's doing is like it's going to look at all the vectors around it and it's going to try to throw this vector back in so you'll have something that is kind of an average of what's around right and the matte dilation is basically going to give you a feather around your matte that is going to slowly go into what inside the mats, you know, so the vectors are not changing abruptly. So you can do use these two if you want to have still have some vectors in it. And that's pretty much it. Then the um, then you can export here. So if you click here, uh, it will create a write node, and from that write node, it's all set up. Uh, you can just uh, create a EXR sequence here, and it will have uh, everything you need to reload these vectors. But for the demonstration here, I'm not going to write anything. I'm just going to use it directly out of the thing. You can do that. It's usually not recommended because it takes time to process. Once you have it written, then it doesn't take time to process anymore. It just takes time to read the image. So when you look at these uh, channels here, you can see uh, the vectors. And so now we know that this is working because every frame is generating a new vector. So that means that we can, now we have these vectors. So you e either have it in that form or you have a read node with the EXR that you just wrote uh, from this. You can use that input into another uh, node. So for example, you can use the vector distort node. So you give it the source and then you give it the smart vectors, right? And from there, this will distort whatever image you choose to distort according to the vectors. Let's say I want to remove that, uh, that tree here. Before we do that, actually, let's look at the vector distort node and the parameters. So the reference frame is the frame that will be warped. Uh, what it does is you pick that frame. So let's say here we're going to do 50 um, because that's the frame that I think, oh, this is a good frame to paint it out. For example, that frame here would maybe not be a good frame because it's kind of far. And obviously this frame here is not a really good frame to paint it out either because it's out of frame, it's half out of frame. So pick a frame that you feel like, okay, this is a good uh, frame to paint out. And this is going to be my reference frame, right? The hold frame is to only grab this frame, which means that, okay, whatever I'm going to distort, I'm only going to distort that frame. If you uncheck that, well, it's going to deform every frame onto the next. And uh, for our case here, you don't want that. We just don't want to, we just want to paint that out. Frame distance is talking back to whatever we decided to do here, right? I've picked four, so I'm going to pick four here. Another way of looking at this is, uh, the low value will match the, the nearby frames better, right? So if you have something around two frame before, two frame after, are gonna match really good if you have a lower value because it's matching low frame distance. If you do higher value, it's gonna match better on the long run, right? So here we have something pretty high, so it's going to match on the long run. The way this is written is that actually the actual frame distance is a power of two of that. So here will be two to the power of four, which would be 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, so 16. 16 frames. That's about how the optimal match would be. And you can go up to 6, which is uh, 64. That's something to play with. You don't exactly need to understand. You need to know that the lower values are going to work better on the a few frames distance, and then the high value is going to work better on the longer frame distance, like 30 frames or 15 frames. The next thing is uh, the output. So what do you want to look at? There are different way of outputting the distortion. One is just to show you the distortion, and that's what that it is by default. Right? It's just going to show you this frame distorted. We can start looking, and you'll understand what I mean. So now we're looking at the vector distort, and as I'm going forward, 
it looks like it's still the the same movement but actually what it's doing is like it's taking the frame 50 that we decided was the reference frame and it's distorting it uh, according to the vectors it has right so you can see it's doing a pretty good job because it feels like it's the same plate but actually if you compare the original plate with this one you can see like so it's not exactly perfect like some of the vectors are not 100 percent accurate because obviously there's parallax and a lot of things happening in the plate and of course whatever was not here on frame 50 so if we go back to frame 50 you see there's no sky then 10 frames or 20 frames later it doesn't have the sky right because it's morphing or grabbing everything from the frame 50. that's also one of the reason why when we picked frame 50 to paint this thing we take it so there's room around it we're not gonna paint out something that's gonna be close to the edge and that will create this kind of things here by dragging the last pixel so that's what it does right it's moving everything this way so if you go really far in the sequence you're gonna probably end up with something a little crazy. Like a lot of distortion is gonna happen because you're way too far from the original frame. So with this, you can compensate a little bit if you have a six here that you have picked in there in the smart vector, it probably would work better here overall. But to delete this thing, I think this distance of like 15 frames or 16 frames is probably good. So we'll leave it at that. The other way you can output is the ST maps. And for that, I will send you back to the videos I made on the ST map. So what it's doing, it's creating an ST map, so a deformation map of the deformation from the reference frame to the current frame, right? So here you can see frame 50. If you looked at our video on the ST map, it's no deformation. It means that the value here at the bottom are 0, 0, and then the value here are 1, 1. And you know, it's all like a zero to one, zero to one. There's no deformation. But then if you move a little further, you're gonna start seeing more deformation. See now it's a whole different thing. So it has moved into, this is the ST map that's describing the deformation between frame 50 and frame, uh, let's say 150. So if you wanna see what it does, we can uh, use the ST map. And again, I will refer you to the video that I've created earlier. And I plug the ST map into this because now this is the RST map. Um, the UV channel is the red, green, blue channel. So I'm going to do that. And now there you go. So that's the distortion that happens between frame 50 and frame 150. So this is a way to record the distortion between the reference frame to the current frame. And the inverse one is recording a distortion that goes from the current frame to the reference. So that's two ways of recording distortions, basically. And for our example, we're going to keep the warp source. The blur size is basically blurring the ST map, a simple blur on the ST map. You usually do that when you want to avoid anomalies or you know small distortions. Uh, that's a good way to average the ST map, the distortion, you know, by, by blurring it. So that's the way to do it. Okay, so let's go back to our frame 50, try to paint this thing out and uh, see how we can uh, have it for the whole duration of the thing painted out. So what you want to do is you want to do a paint on one frame and in this case we want to do it on the reference frame. So I'm going to do a quick paint. So now that we've painted out this tree and you can take the obviously you can take the time you want to do it uh, better but just for example I think this will work. So now we know that this frame here that we picked frame 50 that we painted uh, is going to be distorted the whole time. So now we can see it is taking that paint on that one frame and then pulling it to whatever frame. So if we go to frame 70, see the paint still holds. And if we go backward, it's gonna do the same thing too. It still holds, still good. So we can go to frame 50 and look at our tree and the paint we did for that tree. And then we can create an alpha here that covers our paint, uh, that covers the tree and the vector distort is going to drag this alpha as well and the reason why we would want to do that is that we can drag it also with the with the vector distort right and this way we can just comp this part over the original footage and have our paint going over this piece knowing that we don't alter anything else right and that would be our shot right now this tree is gone and obviously here the vectors are not great because they are going outside of the frame so there's not really any information on where this goes so you're always going to have these kind of things but you know there will be uh, other ways to to fix that but for now you can see that most of the, the time the paint holds during the whole shot
so that's it that's what the smart vectors are i hope this helped i know this is sometimes a little hard to understand but it's also something very easy to practice so i would encourage you to just try you know download some of the footage and try to paint something out to see how it works um all right that's it for today I really appreciate you guys' comments and I really am uh, trying to uh, do the videos that you guys are requesting. Uh, I know there's a couple more videos that I'm due uh, that have been requested, but I'm trying to follow up. So uh, I'm doing that on my uh, spare time. So uh, if you're a little patient, it will come ultimately. And uh, I will start also to prepare other types of videos that are more about the tools that you can use for comps uh, outside of Nuke. You know, some little tools, some little uh, utilities that you can use for uh, for compositing. All right. So I'll see you next time.